morning. My name is Charles Severa. How are you doing today? Good, Charlie. How are you? Oh, not bad, not bad. So, Ted, what we're doing today, I don't know if you're aware of it, we're doing an oral history of all the vets of the different wars and their contributions, what they did. We're also looking to get your experiences, your, your, your feelings, your emotions, anything corresponding to that particular time period. What do you think? You all set to go? Oh, sure. Let's go. Well, Ted, we, let's start off with, uh, where were you born? Revere, Massachusetts. When? January 2nd, 1925. Oh, just at the, uh, before the Depression. Right. How was it, uh, well, you, you were young when the Depression hit. What was it like up in Revere at that time? Well, Revere wasn't too bad. It was, uh, it was uh, sort of a middle class area, working people and their families lived there. And uh, we felt the depression. Uh, my father had a good job before the depression, which he lost. And uh, during the depression, he worked at, uh, one time he was working three different jobs just to keep the family together. And uh, on several occasions, he couldn't make the mortgage payments. They mortgaged off the house but uh, he was able to arrange to have a friend buy it, and then he bought it back from the friend several times. So it, it wasn't easy. I mean, it, we grew up with bare bones. <laughs> well, you, apparently your father had some good friends to be able to make those type of arrangements. Yes, he really did. He's a good man. He had to be a well-respected man. He was. Uh, Ted, where did you go to school? Up in Revere? Revere, Massachusetts. I graduated in June 1942. Oh. June of 42, right after the uh, Battle of Midway. Right. Where did you end up going in 42? Did you sign up for the service? They, what transpired? Yeah, I'd, I'd already uh, put in an application for the Mass Maritime School you know, my junior year before, the, before we get into the war. And then um, a couple of friends of my brothers who were a year or two older uh, were also planning on going to that school, but uh, they found out about the Merchant Marine Cadet Corps. The uh, difference was that you had to pay tuition to go to Mass Maritime, but they paid you, they actually paid you for going to the Merchant Marine Cadet Corps. So uh, it wasn't easy to change. Is this the, <laughs> this, this, is that the advertisement? This is a uh, recruiting brochure. Let me zero in on that a little bit so, you can, so we can all see what you were looking at at that okay, time. Okay, and it was something like this that made the final decision with me to, to go ahead and join them. And that was in 42? Right, somewhere in 42 I, I switched the application over to the Merchant Marine Academy, right? And that was, when you say Mass Maritime, you're talking about Massachusetts Maritime Academy? That, that's correct. Uh, okay. Yeah. So wh when did you uh, enter into the, uh, that is the Kings Point, uh, Kings Point Maritime Academy? Well, let me say that um, uh, the war broke out on January, on December the 7th, when Japan bombed Pearl Harbor. At that time, I was a senior in high school, but I was only 16 years old. However, the fall of, uh, December 7th was a Sunday, the following day was Monday, and uh, I think that every kid in the high school went through a recruiting station that day. I don't think anybody, any of the boys went to school. So I joined my friends and we all, we went up to the Navy to join the Navy. Spent all day up there filling out all their paperwork, taking their physicals. And uh, finally I got home that night with all these papers that my parents had to sign because I was only 16. <laughs> well, of course, they didn't sign it because I only had six months more to go to high school and I had this application pending for the Merchant Marine. So uh, then, um, just before I graduated, I got a notice from the Academy, Merchant Marine Academy, the Cadet Corps at the time, that uh, they had accepted me. However, I had to be 18 years of old before they would take me in. So I graduated in uh, June, I was 17 and a half, and I went to work in a shipyard in East Boston. Well, that was a great experience. I went as a ship, ship fitter's helper. And uh, my uncle had some influence with the uh, man who ran the, the work gangs. So 
I was employed almost every day. You know, I had these uh, shape ups. Right. Where right. a big mob stands in front of the boss and he points out the ones that uh, he wants to work that day. Well, I got picked almost every day. But they didn't always have ship fitters work, so I ended up working for riveters, blacksmiths, boilermakers. Any jobs that were available that they needed some help on that day, I got assigned to. So I, I really had a wide experience there. Yeah, so you were able to see every facet of the ship being, the, uh, right. being built. Uh, one of the things was on the um, the Queen Mary was in and it had a boiler problem. It was was across the harbor in the uh, South Boston Army base, and uh, they assigned me that day to work with the boilermakers. So I know why, because the job involved climbing in through the uh, aperture in the boiler and these other guys were big and fat they never fit <laughs> so I got sent to climb in there I forget what it was now I had to tighten up some bolts or something I forget but anyhow I ended up crawling inside one of the boilers on a Queen Mary. Was that in the firebox or in the steam space? It must have been the firebox. It was a firebox. Yeah okay. That had to be one dirty job. Yeah. <laughs> then so, the time I was, I was with the um, the riveters I was down in the bottom of a hold of a tanker and the, they were heating the rivets up on the deck and then they would toss the rivets down into the hold and I was the catcher down there. So they toss a rivet down there, you know, you had to catch it in this bucket and then you had a pair of tongs, you had to pluck it out and pass it, or put it in the hold so the riveter, uh, there's a riveter outside and a riveter inside and they ram this thing together so that was exciting. And uh, oh, the first job I had when I went to work in the shipyard was working with a blacksmith. And he was an old Italian gentleman. And he had been doing blacksmith work for years, I guess. But uh, he needed somebody to help him this day because what he was doing was he would heat something and put it on the anvil. And then he needed somebody to hit this. He had a tool he put on top of that to shape it. Then he needed somebody with a sledgehammer to hit that tool to create the shape that he was trying to get. I, I've never done any hard label like this before <laughs> in my life. And you had to really hit this thing with a hammer. So you ended up, you had to swing it over your head. This is a 16 pound sledgehammer. Right. Over your head and down like that. And you had to hit that thing dead center. If you didn't hit it dead center, if you gave it a glancing blow, this, this tool that he was holding would glance off and hit him in the stomach. <laughs> <laughs> How many times did that happen? He was one tough guy, I'll say. <laughs> <laughs> so I survived that. And, and another thing about the shipyard was uh, we were repairing merchant ships. And uh, when there were ships in there to be worked on, they used to work around the clock. But they had like two shifts. And uh, the shift I was on during the day, we would work uh, 10 hours on weekdays and eight hours on Saturday and Sunday as long as there were ships in there. So it was uh, it was quite an experience. I really enjoyed Especially that. for a 17 and, a, 17 and a half year old boy. Yeah, but that first day yeah. when I went home after swinging that sledgehammer, I couldn't move my arms. <laughs> I, <laughs> I almost gave it up right then and there. So you became 18 and you went straight right. so down then, to Kingsport? Uh, the day after I turned 18, I set off for uh, Pass Christiane, Mississippi where they had uh, one of three uh, basic training schools for the Merchant Marine Cadet Corps. And uh, the deal was at the time you did 10 weeks of basic training, then you went to sea for six months, then you went back to the academy for nine months, which is a total of about 18 months. And in that time you could develop and get a license as a third mate or a third assistant engineer. So I went in as a deck officer and uh, after the uh, Ten weeks training. I get sent over to um, New Orleans. May I ask you one question before yeah. you go on to New Orleans? Why did you go in as a deck officer? Because of all the experience you had in the shipyard uh, before in the engine room? No, it, it <laughs> predates that. Um, in my younger days, I became a Boy Scout when I was 11 years old, and I really ate that stuff up. You know, the knot tying and the competition, and all that kind of stuff. When I became 14 years old, I joined a Sea Scout troop. The Sea Scout troop had a 55-foot boat that had been, uh, it, it had been uh, in the custom service or something like that. It was a harbor patrol craft. 
It had two of the hugest gasoline engines I've ever seen in my life. They're called Murray and Murray, if anybody is familiar with them. I mean, great big engines. This thing could do uh, unbelievable speeds. Now, we never got to see how fast it could really go because uh, they blew out a cylinder. And uh, just as I joined, this is what they were doing. They're replacing one of those engines, and they replaced it with a truck motor. <clears throat> so after we, after we got the thing operating again, and we went on a regatta with some other Sea Scout ships. Well, in a regatta, it's like a convoy. You've got to uh, keep your station, so to speak. Well, because of the inequity of these two engines, they used to run the truck engine full speed and the Murray and Murray engine slow speed, and then you had difficulty keeping it going straight. <laughs> but it was some ex that was again was some experience, and uh, I learned a lot in the Sea Scouts, and I was very interested in it. And uh, as when the war broke out, the older fellows either volunteered or got drafted. And there weren't any older fellows left, so I became like the oldest guy in there about age 17. And I became a mate in the Sea Scots, which was, you really had to be at least 18, and maybe even 21, I forget now. But that's like being an assistant scoutmaster. So I had that responsibility uh, at the age of 16 and 17, somewhere around there. So that gave you the... And, uh, and then I had... Been, uh, become so interested in seagoing things. Uh, as a matter of fact, up until about that point, my family always thought I was going to be a doctor. <laughs> that, <laughs> that changed about that time. And uh, that's when I got some salt water in my blood. And, uh, another thing, where we grew up in Revere, it's, it's right on the ocean, it's, it's in an inlet. I forget the name of the inlet now, but uh, from my bedroom window, I could see Grave Lighthouse and the ships going in and out of Boston Harbor. That's on one side. We lived two streets away from the ocean. And we lived on a high hill, so uh, you know, you'd get good visibility. We could see all the way over to the hand. And on a clear day, you could see Marblehead and all the sailboats racing, uh, racing out there. It's really a, a nice area to grow up in. And then that was two streets away from the Atlantic Ocean going the opposite way about six or seven streets, maybe eight streets, uh, you came to a big marsh which had an inlet in it called Belle Isle Inlet which fed out to Boston Harbor. The Sea Scouts had their boat on that Belle Isle Inlet and also some of my friends had sailboats on that inlet so it was common for us to uh, go out the inlet into Boston Harbor and I did many a sail trip and, and uh, on the Sea Scout boat. In, uh, I think it was 1939 when having the World's Fair down in New York, I think it was on Long Island, but in New York area, uh, we had set out in our Sea Scout boat to go to the World's Fair. And uh, right in the middle of Boston Harbor, it started, the wind started to kick up and everything, and a few hours later, right in the midst of a hurricane. So we managed to make it into a harbor. Uh, that's about it. We had a little damage to the boat, but we survived. And our parents were right, worried sick about us. <laughs> but we thought it was great fun. <laughs> so, so now you so completed your, your, your time down, your basic down in Mississippi, and your, was it six months at sea, you said? Right. You're supposed to go six months to sea. Right. But unfortunately, um, the first trip I made was four and a half months. So that meant I, I needed another month and a half to make up my six months. But the ship decided to go on a longer cruise than that. So it was, uh, I spent, uh, I spent nine and a half months on that first ship. And then um, they had a, another program, if you did nine months at sea, they had a, a program, it was called Being a Special, and uh, you would go out to sea until you had 12 months at sea, and then uh, they would bring you back to the academy for a license prep course for a month or so, and you could get a license that way too. Uh, while you were a cadet going to sea, they gave you what they called a sea project, which was huge books like this of work assignments to do and drawings to make of the ship. And, how everything worked, you know, describing it, and making sketches, answering questions. So it was really, and then the things you didn't know, you had to go and ask the officers about. 
And even though I was a deck officer, we actually had to do some uh, engine work. We had to know something about the engines. And uh, I, w I get taken off the ship. No. Because I had the nine and a half months in, they made me a special. They signed me to a, uh, a tanker, which uh, was a brand new tanker. And uh, it went from uh, Philadelphia, I think. I think it was Philadelphia, and then we went down to um, Texas, loaded aviation gasoline to bring over to Europe. <clears throat> Came back up to New York to load a deck cargo, and at that point the uh, people from the academy came aboard and they took me off the ship. At this point I had about 11 and a half months at sea. I only needed a couple more weeks and then I could have gone to the cram course and got my license. So what had happened was that uh, my father was very dissatisfied with me being a special. He wanted me to go to that Merchant Marine Academy. So he had called up a congressman friend of his and uh, that's how I got yanked off. And I was sent out to the academy for nine months. <laughs> and I, I really wasn't happy about it. So I missed, uh, I missed a lot of stuff because I didn't make the D-Day invasion. I was there almost the whole of 1944. That's a picture right behind you, isn't it, of the Academy at that time? Right, that's a picture of the Academy on Dedication Day, which is in uh, 1944. And I was present at that time. I was somewhere. In somewhere in that uh, compound. Right. You wouldn't know where at that time, did you? <laughs> well, I remember that... Uh, the room I was in was two doors away from the mess hall, and uh, it was very common when we're doing our studies at night that one of us would wander over and talk to one of the bakers in the mess hall, and he'd bring back, we'd bring back fresh bread and stuff like that. Can you, could you mind standing up and give us a little tour of the uh, of the academy? Well, this is the training ship Emery Rice here, okay. which was not active. At, uh, it was active here, but it, it wasn't used for sailing at that time. It was usually tied up at the dock. Uh, this is called Mallory Pier, and this is where the small boats used to come in. And these were the lifeboats over here. We used to have lifeboat drill. Also, you could take these lifeboats out after classes, and they had sails on them. And, uh, I remember one time we sailed across uh, Long Island Sound and uh, Fort Schuyler was on the other side. <clears throat> and uh, one of our guys, a couple of them drank beer, so they wanted to go ashore and get some beer. So uh, we stayed in the boat and a couple of guys went ashore. One guy got caught ashore by an officer from Fort Schuyler. And uh, this guy that got caught happened to know a kid that was going to Port Schuyler and we had the same kind of uniforms so this officer asked him what his name was and he put out the name of his friend at Port Schuyler <laughs> <laughs> so uh, he comes back to the boat and he had the beer and he says oh my gosh I ran into this officer up there I think he put me on report but I gave him my friend's name instead <laughs> So a month or two later, he got a letter from his friend saying that uh, for some reason they put on report for being in a place where he shouldn't have been, you know, after all. No, funny as hell. Okay, but uh, these were the classrooms up in this area here. And these were the barracks over here. And the mess hall was right in, right in here. So uh, this is the administration building. This is the old uh, Chrysler Estate. Uh, the government had purchased this uh, from Walter Chrysler, who uh, had a lot of money, I guess. But anyhow, it made a very nice school. All these buildings were put up in 1942 and 1943, except that one. I think there was a couple of other little buildings throughout the, the estate, but uh, that was the main thing. Uh, this is the engineering building here, and they had. They have quite an engineering school at King's Point. It's supposed to be the best marine engineering school in the country. Bar none. <laughs> um, when I went to New Orleans, uh, that was to report to the officer there who was going to assign me to a ship. 
and it turned out that the ship was in Houston, Texas, and it was just coming out of a, a shipyard. So uh, there again, I had another excellent opportunity because everything was brand new and a lot of things like ropes had to be spliced and wire runners had to be spliced. So uh, I got into doing some of that. And uh, when I first went onto the ship, uh, they assigned me to deck duties, just like a regular, ordinary seaman. And I worked alongside the able seaman and the bosun and uh, learned an awful lot of stuff that I wouldn't have learned if the ship was already in commission. So I had that advantage too. So then we set out from Houston and uh, went over to uh, New Orleans and loaded uh, general kind of cargo for San Juan, Puerto Rico. I got to tell you that um, on this ship, uh, they are very short-handed at the time because they are building these ships so fast and getting men to man them was very difficult. Uh, one of the things about the Merchant Marine was that everyone was a volunteer. There was nobody ever drafted and put into the Merchant Marine. However, because of the shortage, they, the Navy did release some men to go into the Merchant Marine, especially to attend the Merchant Marine Academy to become officers. So, uh, I haven't gotten here yet. Where am I? Okay, uh, what, what I want to tell you was that uh, all the men on the ship were green. Except the captain, he was an old timer. The chief engineer was an old timer. The, uh, the head steward, when he came aboard the ship, he had to climb up a Jacob's ladder, and I happened to be standing on the deck when he came aboard, and I see this wooden leg come over, <laughs> over <laughs> from the Jacob's ladder, and that's the chief steward. He had a wooden leg. The radio operator had one eye. He had a glass eye. Uh, the ABs and the ordinary seamen, most of the ordinary seamen were just out of training school. Most of the ABs had sailed maybe three or four months as an ordinary seaman, just enough to qualify them to become able-bodied seamen. Uh, the chief mate was an older man, but he had been sailing on the Great Lakes. This is his first trip on the high seas. And uh, the gun crew, I can't say enough about them. They were a great bunch of guys, but they were all young kids and most of them were hillbillies, if you excuse, excuse the expression. But for instance, there was, there was one kid on there from the hills of Kentucky, and I couldn't understand what that guy was saying for a month or two. <laughs> oh, he had the, the worst accent of anybody. A gunnery officer had been a shoe salesman, but because he had a college degree, they gave him a 90-day wonder course, and he became an officer in the Navy, and the, Gunnery officer. The Navy, the gun crew was Navy, by the way, versus the merchant crew, which was all civilians. So we started out uh, with this kind of a crew, and we made it over to San Juan, no problem. Dropped off our cargo, and then uh, we proceeded to. Yeah, so January, oh, this is April of 43 now. Uh, okay. Oh, this is interesting. Can I read some of this? Yeah, sure. Okay, I had uh, just uh, recently finished uh, making this up. What I was doing was uh, uh, going through and making a record of my career for my grandchildren. And uh, I had written away and gotten copies of the uh, Navy Gunnery Officer's logbook for this first ship that I was a cadet on. And uh, because I have his logbook, I can quote with some detail of what actually happened on this first trip. And I'd, li I'd like to do that. Okay, well, I got here that uh, the armed guard was all fresh out of boot camp except for third class gunnery petty officer.
Okay, after we uh, left New Orleans and headed for San Juan, we were in convoy. I wouldn't have remembered this except I got his notes. And we received messages stating there were submarines in the area south of the Florida Keys. The escorts dropped depth charges several times during the day and toward evening a blimp arrived and assisted by dropping some bombs. We arrived in San Juan and discharged our cargo. We then proceeded to Porto Prince Haiti to load sugar. We were part-time in convoy and part-time alone. We were the first ship in that port for six months. Okay, so the uh, people in uh, Port-au-Prince wanted cash for their sugar. The captain didn't have cash. This was a Likes Brothers run ship, but Likes Brothers didn't have an agent in Port-au-Prince. Port so they sent us from there to Santiago, Cuba. Okay, we loaded a full uh, cargo of raw sugar at San Diego and we're proceeding independently to Guantanamo Bay to join a convoy bound for New York. One day when the general alarm sounded, I headed for my battle station, uh, which was, I was the hot shellman on the three-inch gun aft. It's a three-inch 50. The two ma Navy men who were on watch fired around, and I could see that, I could see that it fell short as the men on the submarine were running toward their bow gun. As I climbed into the gun tub, they fired a second round, which I could see going out of the barrel of the gun and falling a short distance astern of us. Then on the submarine, quickly went below after the first round and the submarine submerged. The barrel of our gun had split from the end and back about three feet. Allied submarines gave smoke signals before they surfaced and no signals were made by this sub. As far as I knew, everyone believed that this was an enemy submarine. Fifty years later, when I was able to receive a copy of the Navy reports concerning the ship, I was amazed to see that the gunnery officer had found out that this was an American submarine. Anyhow, we proceeded at flank speed to Guantanamo. About an hour after the encounter, we came upon an American destroyer. <clears throat> we reported the incident to the destroyer, and the response was that there were no submarines operating in the vicinity. <laughs> We left Guantanamo in a 30-ship convoy with five escorts and planes and blimps frequently overhead. <coughs> Arrived in New York and loaded deck cargo of aircraft. Departed New York in 52-ship convoy with a British escort of five vessels. Off Halifax, eight more ships joined the convoy and several more escorts and an aircraft carrier also joined. Occasionally, the escorts dropped depth charges, but there are no other indications of submarines. We went first to Lockheed, Scotland, and then to London, England. A new barrel was put on the 3-inch gun at Lockheed, and an additional 3-inch 50 was installed on the bow, and an anti-aircraft balloon was installed. On the trip down the English Channel, we saw aircraft flying back and forth, but none came close enough to us to be identifiable. <clears throat> London was being bombed occasionally, and one morning when I came on deck, there were small pieces of shrapnel on the deck. We were provided with gas masks, and it was mandatory to have them when you were ashore. Can I tell a joke? One evening, the steward was seen leaving the ship with the neck and head of a raw chicken protruding from his gas mask bag. Food was scarce in Britain at the time. I guess he was trying to help out the war effort. <coughs> the return trip to New York was uneventful. 15 ship convoy to Lock Hugh, then a 92 ship convoy to New York. This voyage was midsummer, and evening general quarters would start about 9 p.m. and end about 10 p.m. And then the AM GQ would begin again about midnight. The convoy route was very much to the north and very close to Iceland. At one time, it went through an ice field. Although the icebergs were compar comparatively small in size, you could feel the coolness from them as they passed between the columns of ships. <clears throat> After arrival in New York, the ship was loaded with ammunition in the hold crated aircraft on deck. It seemed <coughs> there was a big rush to get this cargo moving overseas. And it wasn't until later we found the cargo was for Russia and to be delivered to the Persian Gulf. We left New York in convoy to Norfolk, Virginia and joined a convoy consisting of 58 ships, 13 destroyers and a merchant armed cruiser. The gunnery officer noted in his log that a final watch and station bill 
including volunteers from the merchant crew, was posted. This is very significant because after the war was over, uh, when, when President Roosevelt signed the GI Bill of Rights, as he was signing it, he said that he hoped that Congress would grant the Merchant Marine the same rights because of what we went through. But it never happened. So for many years, there were groups that fought with the government to get us the status of being veterans, and that didn't finalize until 1988, 45 years later. But uh, we manned the guns, the same as the gunnery people. They didn't, they never had enough Navy gunners to man all the guns they had on the ship, so they had to have people at least passing the ammunition for them. So everybody on the merchant crew who was not assigned to maneuvering the ship was assigned to a gun station. And at first my gun station was on that 3 inch 50 on the stern. And then eventually I got to be the messenger on the bridge after I got promoted off the, off the deck gang and it was treated more like an officer. <laughs> but the first part of the voyage I was, I was treated just like uh, an ordinary seaman and uh, got you know to know all the ropes of being a deck hand. And the second part, which is what we're about to, to talk to now, I was more uh, becoming an officer and I was standing watches with the, we had a junior third mate on that ship, I was standing watches with him, four to eight watch. <clears throat> okay, so here we go. Uh, as we approached the entrance of the Mediterranean Sea, a message was received, the submarines were in the vicinity, and all ships so equipped were ordered to steam, to stream anti-torpedo nets, the first time for our ship. So uh, just to briefly tell you about the torpedo nets, uh, we had two sets of huge booms extending from the side of the ship, and uh, one was forward and one was aft on each side, and then they would, would stream a steel net which protected almost uh, the entire length of the ship. And uh, the idea was that if a torpedo hit the nets, it would be deflected and either to the side or underneath the ship. The speed with these nets was only about five knots, and the ship was very hard to handle. Thank you. This is, this is a picture of a Liberty ship, and it's streaming the torpedo nets. You can see this boom very well here. This is the forward boom here, and this is the after boom on the port side. So if you turn the, that's it, that, that's good. Get the right. uh, you can see the boom going up on the side of the ship, and the nets ran between that boom and this one down on the stern, on each side. Okay. And you say they were, they were done at a 45, how did they maintain the 45 degree angle? What 45 degree angle? There wasn't any angle. Wasn't it just, they just hung straight They just down. hung, yeah. They, they had like, uh, they had a device on the bottom to sort of keep them straight. Okay, so <coughs> there we are, uh, doing about five knots in this convoy with our torpedo nets out. At this time I was standing watch with a junior third mate on the 48 watch. About 5 a.m. a ship ahead and to our port, in the next column showed two red lights, the signal for being not under control. I went to summon the captain to the bridge and by the time we returned, the ship, a British LST, was heading into our port torpedo net. The captain maneuvered the ship trying to avoid collision, but the after boom of the torpedo net swept over the foredeck of the LS LST and took off whatever was there bending the boom in the process, and the net was damaged and was jettisoned. The LST had surged forward and smashed our port lifeboats and Davids. The LST dropped the stern and we did not see it again. And during the night, the ship ahead of us fired several rounds to her starboard quarter. An escort ex exchanged messages by blink light which we were unable to read, but no further activity followed. After we passed Gibraltar, we did some emergency turns and zigzag courses. Zigzag meant uh, you steered various courses for different lengths of time 
so that if a, a submarine was tracking you, they would uh, not be able to do so very easily because the changes in course were very erratic and, and not uh, they were they were in a pattern, but it was a very long pattern, so you you'd have to spend a lot of time to detect what the pattern was. Okay, as we proceeded through the Mediterranean, vessels left the convoy for Iran, Algiers, Bizerti, and Malta as we passed. At one time, we were alerted for an air attack, but it did not happen. Another time, we were ordered to zigzag, and depth charges were dropped close to our ship, but there was no further incident. More ships left convoy at, at Alexandria. We arrived in Port Said and entered the Suez Canal. An air raid alert was sounded. Reconnaissance planes were seen over Port Said, but we secured from general quarters without incident. We anchored in Great Bitter Lake for the night, anchored the next day in Port Suez, and then sailed down the Red Sea unescorted and anchored in Aden, Arabia. We sailed from Aden about 8 a.m. alone, following another American Liberty ship loaded with ammunition, the same as us, which left about an hour earlier. We had been advised that there was no submarine activity recently in the area. However, we were ordered to zigzag during daylight hours. About 8 p.m. that night, there was a bright glow and several green flares over the horizon dead ahead of us. Ten minutes later, we received a message that two enemy submarines had been reported 60 miles ahead of our position. The captain turned the ship around and we headed back to Aden. The gun crew stayed at the stations all night long. Guess what? There was a convoy leaving in a couple of days for the foreign ships anchored in Aden that were going to the Persian Gulf. Nobody ever explained why the two American ships carrying ammunition were told to proceed alone. Okay, the convoy consisted of seven ships and two Indian Navy corvettes as escort. As we passed through the Strait of Hormuz into the Persian Gulf, which is a very narrow passage. If uh, you're familiar with the Persian Gulf, because it had a lot of activity over there lately. About midnight on a very dark and overcast night, the ship was violently shaken by a double sounding explosion which threw some, some men sleeping out on the hatches from their cots. General quarters were sounded. The gunnery officer reported the sea boiled up and due to the unusual phosphorescence of the water, a brilliant glow appeared. <coughs> the vessel was checked for damage and none was apparent and we were not taking on water. About an hour after the first explosion, another similar event occurred and we remained at GQ for the rest of the night. In the morning, the escort commander was asked if he had dropped depth charges near us during the night. He said no and the origin of the explosions is not known. And this is in quotes, in response to the gunnery officer's report, the Navy later advised that the enemy was using a new kind of sonic detonating torpedo. We proceeded to the Shat al Arab River and anchored below Karum Shah. Some of the cargo was unloaded to barges before we were able to go alongside a dock. The Army allowed us to see the movies being shown to the troops. There were Russian Army officers checking on the unloading of the ships, and they were not at all liked by anyone else. They were so arrogant and unfriendly. A friendly American GI who had a jeep at his disposal took us on a sightseeing tour. Two things stand out, <coughs> two things stand out to this day. First, there was an army medical compound located remotely in the desert. We were told that the patients there were being isolated because they contracted diseases for which they did not have a cure or even a name. Secondly, we saw an area filled with what appeared to be crated airplanes for as far as the eye could see and they were in such a rush to get our cars over here. We left the Persian Gulf and headed to Lorenzo Marx, Portu Portugal, East Africa. It's now called uh, Mozambique. Uh, later was called Mozambique and may be now called something else, I'm not sure. We were in a 16-ship convoy with two escorts along the southern coast of Arabia. The escort signaled contact with the submarine and dropped, dropped depth charges intermittently for about an hour and a half but then they resumed their position. Two days later, we were proceeding alone. We zigzagged by day and night. We have been told that any ship we encountered was to be considered suspicious as there was still a possibility of German raiders being around. We did encounter one very, very heavily armed merchant ship, but fortunately for us, it was British. 
Portugal remained neutral during World War II, and we learned that a German submarine had been in Lorenzo Marx the previous week. One night, our crew wanted to bring a black crew member into a segregated white nightclub. <clears throat> there was such a commotion that the police were called and herded us back to the ship, and there was no more liberty for the crew in that port. After I returned home from this voyage, I read in the newspaper that a Norwegian ship had opened fire on this town with a 20 millimeter guns after a similar incident. <coughs> Our next port of call was Durban, South Africa, where we received orders to proceed to Rio de Janeiro. We zigzagged our way across the South Atlantic without incident, but crossed the equator twice, where the captain would not allow initiations. We discharged our cargo and then went to Santos, Brazil to load coffee. We returned to Rio to join a convoy to Trinidad. Four U.S. and seven Brazilian merchant ships and a Brazilian cruiser, two Brazilian destroyers, and a U.S. PC patrol craft. Off Recife, Brazil, the Brazilian ships were replaced by a U.S. destroyer and five more U.S. PCs, and then we arrived in Trinidad without incident. From, Guant from Trinidad to Guantanamo, ten ships in convoy were escorted by four U.S. patrol craft with the U.S. Coast Guard cut a bib in command. My older brother Bill was a radio man on the bib. Off Guantanamo, the escorts were relieved by five patrol craft, U.S. The following day, two underwater explosions jarred the ship and the escort commander fired off three green flares. We made some emergency turns and no further incidents occurred. We arrived in New York at the end of January 1944, and while I was home on leave, the local newspaper announced that the coffee shortage had been relieved. Okay, after I uh, did my time at sea as a cadet, I went to the Merch Marine Academy at Kings Point, New York for nine months. I graduated at the end of November 1944, and then I started uh, sailing as a third mate, and uh, my first assignment was on a coal collier running coastwise uh, just to replace a man who had uh, death in the family. And, needed some relief. Then I got assigned to a Liberty ship, the SS John Catron, and uh, we sailed to France with ammunition. Uh, then we came back, loaded ammunition again for a second trip to France, and uh, after we had been at sea for a few days, uh, VE Day occurred, and the ship was sent back to Norfolk, Virginia. We still had this load of ammunition on there. It was 75 and 105 millimeter uh, army artillery shells. So uh, they decided to send us out to the Pacific, we went through the Panama Canal and over to the Philippines, and the fighting was still going on in the Philippine Islands. So we come in on the southeast uh, corner, I forget the names of the ports now, but the southeast corner of the Philippines, and they told us they didn't need the ammunition there, and they sent us around to the west coast of the Philippines, and we bounced, uh, starting from the south, working our way north. Three or four times we were shifted to, to the next port, and we were getting closer and closer to the front because the battle was still raging in the northern Philippines. And finally we, <coughs> we came to a uh, port where um, an army captain said he would take the ammunition off at that port. After that we ferried troops around the Philippines for a while, and then we got sent down to um, Sydney, Australia to load uh, some canteen supplies for the Australian Army. We arrived in uh, Sydney on the second day of the VJ Day celebration, and uh, it actually lasted about a week. But two days was official. But Ted, could, for your descendants, could you please tell them what VE and VJ Day are? Oh yeah, VE was the victory in Europe Day when the uh, German forces finally surrendered. And VJ Day was the uh, day that the Japanese finally surrendered. And um, we loaded the Australian canteen supplies and brought that around to uh, various uh, army locations on the different islands in the South Pacific. Ted, did, did you hear, did you, you and your uh, boat crew people, did you hear what caused the Japanese to surrender? Oh yes, <clears throat> yeah, we heard on the, uh, we had radio contact all the time. 
and uh, we knew that the uh, atomic bomb had been dropped not only once but twice. And we didn't realize, had no idea of the size of this bomb or anything. We just knew it was an enormous new weapon that had been dropped and it caused a lot of devastation and, and was enough to uh, cause the Japanese to surrender. And the reason they dropped the bomb <clears throat> was because uh, the Japanese uh, were such fierce fighters and they refused, in most cases, to surrender. It was a disgrace for Japanese soldiers to surrender, so most of them would die fighting or commit suicide rather than surrender. So uh, <clears throat> the Battle of Okinawa was going on and uh, had just been completed, I guess, and the preparations were being made to invade Japan. And uh, our leaders thought that if we uh, invaded Japan, it would be a, a really bloody mess and uh, millions and millions of Japanese and American and Allied soldiers would have lost their lives and it was better to drop the atomic bomb and kill a few thousand rather than to sacrifice millions. And that's why the decision was made to drop the atomic bomb. Okay, now uh, getting into the, the Navy. I spent, uh, I stayed in the Merchant Marine because uh, we had been requested to uh, to help rebuild Europe and, and Japan and uh, from the war damage. And I continued sailing until 1950 in the Merchant Marine. Uh, at that time I had advanced to become uh, a master. Although I never sailed master, I do have a master license. I did have a master license. Um, then I joined the Navy and spent two years on a uh, seaplane tender, but the main mission of the Navy was to um, carry uh, the commander of the Middle East forces in the Persian Gulf. And uh, that was an eventful two years. It would take another couple hours to, to tell you about that. These are some of the medals that I received, uh, that, that I earned, <laughs> being in the Merchant Marine. Uh, the top row was all issued by the American government. The um, Atlantic, Middle East, Pacific, the Victory Medal. And then uh, I made a mistake. These were issued by different governments. Belgium and France, these two are Russian medals. This one's Yugoslavian, this one's Chinese. Uh, and the French issued a couple. And uh, this is the emblem for the uh, Merchant Marine officer's cap. And uh, these were the captain bars, which I had earned, but was never able to really exercise that authority. These were uh, awarded by uh, the United States Navy. This was a Navy officer's cap insignia. And I, I became a full lieutenant in the, in the Navy. And uh, this is, uh, these are the Navy ribbons that were issued because I was a res Navy Reserve cadet who accepted a Navy Reserve commission upon graduation from the Merchant Marine Academy, which retroactively entitled me to all the Navy ribbons that would have been issued to me. That's how I came by all these. This is the Atlantic Zone, uh, Africa, Middle East, uh, Pacific. Uh, the military victory. This was the one medal I got for being on active duty during the Korean War. And uh, the rest of the, oh, this is the uh, liberation, liberation of the Philippines medal. <clears throat> this is the New York State Conspicuous Service Medal. And uh, these are Navy Reserve and some other kind of Navy medals. Very impressive, Tim. Very impressive. Okay, you got time for any of these pictures or anything? Sure, bring them on. Oh, you want to show some of the ancient stuff first? <coughs> you think this would be a good one? Was that a picture of that? 
During the war, the government built 2,700 Liberty ships. This is a shipyard. They are being mass produced. And you can imagine how fast they're coming off the ways. This is a Liberty ship and a Canadian escort vessel. This is probably taken in the North Atlantic, although it did get rougher than this. This is a pretty rough day, I'll tell you. This is a Liberty ship, and on the deck you can see the crates of deck cargo. We used to carry planes <clears throat> and engines and all kinds of stuff like that on deck. This is probably over in the South Pacific, and many a time we stopped at these little islands to drop off supplies to the various troops who were stationed at that point. This is an American Liberty ship underway, and I sailed on 12 different Liberty ships during my career. I sailed on one T2 tanker. What was the top speed of that ship? Uh, these would do about 11 and a half knots when they were, they were light, but generally in convoy we did about 10 or 10 and a half. You said they had another victory, a uh, victory class uh, ship that did 20? Oh, yeah. Uh, I never sailed on a victory ship. There is a picture of one in here. Now this is a victory ship. What made this one different? Uh, it had a different kind of a engine. I think it had a turbine engine. And it did about 15 knots standard. And uh, the big difference between them was that this has a a cut in the hull here, and it has these Samson posts, and the stack was a lot taller. What do you have there, Ted? Uh, these are some old documents. This is when I was a mate in the Sea Scouts. This is when I was a ship fitter's helper in the shipyard. And this is in uh, 1950 when I went in the Navy. I retired my union card from the Master Mates and Pilots. And when I come out of the Navy, they gave the draft board gave me this card showing I was class 5A, which meant I had met my military obligation. Funny thing about this, it's signed by my uncle who was on a draft board. It was on the uh, draft board. Let's see, let's see if I can get his name. Edmund McKay, is it? Ernest McKay. Ernest McKay. And he never told me earlier that I should not have been forced to go into the Korean War because I had done enough service in the Merchant Marine. Uh, this is when I uh, this is when I was in the Navy. Let's see what a handsome guy I was then. I don't oh, know what I happened. Do it at that time. Here's a picture of the ship, the Navy ship I was on, the seaplane tender. You got your uh, JG bars on in that one. Yeah. Well, this is this is when I was just going in. And uh, well, this is a thing showing my duty on that ship and my immunization record. I have to have a lot of shots if you're going overseas. Was it, let's see your immunization record. What do you have there? Okay. What is cowpox? I've never heard of that. I don't know. Something he had back those days. Okay, let me just tell you briefly, um, when the Korean War broke out, I had just uh, given up the Merchant Marine, and uh, I got a letter from the draft board, a letter from the Navy, and they wanted to know how I was and what I was doing. The, the thing was that uh, I went down to see the draft board, and they told me that uh, I could go back on a merchant ship and stay out to sea, and I wouldn't be drafted. If I didn't go back to sea, then they would draft me, and because I was a Navy officer reserve, they would refer me to the Navy for the length of the draft time. 
I went up and talked to the Navy Department and I found out they had a program called uh, Merchant Marine Reserve Officers Training Program where a Merchant Marine Officer could volunteer for a year's active duty in the Navy which would take care of the military obligation. I signed up for that and after they got me in they told me I had to stay for the length of the draft time which at that time was 18 months and then they extended the draft time to 24 months. I was compelled to stay in the Navy for 24 months. I did not like the Navy after being in the Merchant Marine for eight years with all that freedom and then going into the Navy and having to buckle down all those rules and regulations. That was really tough. But I did enjoy all the time I did spend at sea. And I'll get back again if anybody wants to offer me a job. <laughs> During World War II, 733 American merchant ships were sunk by enemy action. In excess of 6,795 merchant mariners and 1,810 U.S. Navy Armed Guard personnel were killed or missing from a force of 215,000 merchant mariners and 144,000 U.S. Navy personnel. This was equivalent to the losses that the Marine Corps uh, suffered during World War II. This is a, uh, an artist's conception of the sinking of the German raider Steer, which had sunk a lot of Allied ships. This picture depicts Edward J. O'Hara, a cadet from the Merchant Marine Academy, uh, who had come up out of the engine room and saw the devastation on the stern where the gun crew had all been killed. And he ran back, he was, he was so uh, emotionally upset that he found uh, five shells in a ready box ready to fire and he single-handedly loaded the shells and fired them at the steer which thought they had crippled the ship enough and were coming in for the kill and as they approached uh, O'Hara hit him five times. Because of actions like this and because the cadets from the Merchant Marine have to sail into these war zones as part of their training they have been authorized by Congress to have a battle standard, which no other federal academy has. The battle standard has streamers at the top for all the uh, battle areas that the uh, mariners participated in as part of their training. And as you can see from Edwin O'Hara, we manned the guns also. That's the end of my story. Ted, is there anything you want to, else you want to say to your, your descendants regarding the effects of war? Uh, is it still on? Yeah. Let me think about it. I saw a lot of devastation in my travels during World War II. Ships sunk uh, ashore buildings demolished, towns wiped out, and there's a lot of people killed, and uh, it's hard to describe all this stuff to somebody that hasn't seen it, but it does leave a lasting impression if you have seen it. And uh, the times at sea when uh, there was attacks going on around, and uh, initially you feel a little bit afraid, but uh, when you get to your gun stations, you know what you're going to do, and, and we did it on several occasions. Uh, we fired the guns and, and I didn't see anybody uh, that, that was not willing to do whatever he was called upon to do. So I'd say to you that if a war comes, uh, don't be afraid to go out and defend your country. It's a great country and uh, I would do it again. Uh, I, I, I wouldn't join the Merchant Marine and then go into the Navy. If I was going to go in the Navy, I'd do that first and then maybe go into the Merchant Marine afterwards. But if another war does come, and they, they will certainly need a Merchant Marine again, uh, I would suggest that uh, you find out before you sign up for the Merchant Marine if you're going to be a veteran afterwards. Probably you will it now, but anyhow, it was, it was a, great, a great time. What else?